Um, so here to talk about a relatively significant project we've gone through at Lynx um, on our LAN2 network where we deployed, as hinted by the title, an open networking disaggregated solution. Um, so a little bit of a background on the project. Um, we actually run two networks um, in London as part of the London Internet Exchange. We have the one we call LAN1, which is a um, router-based traditional um, Cisco, Nokia, Juniper style solution running VPLS. And LAN2, which at the time was using layer two technology, not quite spanning tree ring protection, but that generation of technology using a traditional uh, layer two vendor. Um, we actually had attempted to move LAN2 to uh, VPLS, but we were, hadn't quite succeeded. Then going back to 2015, um, there seemed to be a tipping point uh, where the bulk of the order stopped being at 10 gigs and appeared at 100 gigs. And we could see that we needed to do um, a change in particular on LAN2 um, with that extra um, uptick. Um, and also the core was going to need to adapt to it as well. Um, even if we didn't change vendor, something needed to be done. Um, so we, we didn't just do a vendor selection. We didn't want to do a like for like replacement. Um, we started talking strategy options. What can we do? And that was very much the steer I got from senior management. Um, take it as an open book. Um, and we've looked all the way from a second traditional router vendor to something that's um, new, what was at that time the new innovative idea of doing open networking and disaggregated. And as you can guess from the subject of the presentation, it was a second. Um, actually, an interesting bit of history. Um, it was actually in San Francisco at a Nanog. We often combine Nanogs with talking to our um, local US vendors as the existing LAN2 vendor communicated that as it stood with their strategy, uh, there wasn't an overlap. So we actually knew at that stage that we were uh, with a new vendor. Um, so we looked for the best strategy. Um, it wasn't, okay, um, that one's still working. It wasn't just a traditional um, select something off the shelf, uh, except for the layer three vendors as a number of requirements that IXPs have that um, don't just work. Um, I'll cover more detail on that. But having taken all the strategies, what we actually uh, then did, because membership led, is go to all our uh, members, those in Europe and London we visited then, but then at 66 down in San Diego, we took the opportunity of quite a few of our members actually being um, in the same um, building um, to actually talk to them direct. So I said we had a couple of things that are different. Now the first one, if you're a carrier, you know that, the port is a demarcation. If you're running a hyperscale data center and you have some unexpected traffic, you call your server guy and say, what on earth are you doing? And you figure it out together. As a service provider, not an option. So you need a lot more instrumentation at the DMARC than if you can just peek the other side. Um, the other thing is best practice is you don't create a giant uh, layer two broadcast domain and connect a whole row, uh, range of speeds and just connect any port anywhere. Better than high speed, that's what you sell. You have no choice uh, but to offer that. Um, it also means that flooding that can be just accidental and tiny for a um, member with multiple hundred gigs, a member with one gig really does not appreciate um, and it can trigger something that's effectively an outage. Um, so the other challenge we come up is max security. Now, if you've ever dealt with a third party data center and you report a fault on the circuit, chances are they'll put a loop back. And if you've ever operated a layer two uh, network, loopbacks are a really bad thing. 
Um, so all IXPs a long way back implemented MAC security, so only known MAC addresses are allowed on ports. Um, the challenge in addition with Broadcom is the way they've implemented learning. It's a fixed pipeline, it does certain operations in a certain order, and learning occurs before the MAC ACL. So even with the MAC ACL, um, resources will be consumed by the learning, packet uplifted, um, and all of a sudden your forwarding capability uh, will be reduced, even though you're gonna drop it and ignore it. Um, so with the Broadcom, we, we know that has to actually be switched off. Um, finally, like a lot of exchanges, we have partner ports. We are actually in um, 12 buildings in London, but that's nothing compared to the whole city. So um, for potential members that can't just order cross-connect to reach us, we use partners for the last mile. Um, they have a port or maybe a lag and present each individual member to us on the VLAN. And we have to do max security not on a port, but now on a VLAN. We need to do um, some form of shaping and policing to make sure that the right bandwidth comes in on the VLAN. But the thing that really does the head in of any traditional layer two vendor um, is that you now have, for example, VLAN 7, 21, 415, and 1052 being mapped to VLAN 100 and having multiple VLANs being mapped to a common VLAN, yes, if you're a layer three vendor, it's a port unit, it's a uh, sub-interface, but if you're a layer two vendor, that really does your head in. Um, so the early steps of the project, how did we get here? Um, we hadn't at this stage um, decided we were going disaggregated, but the best person we found to work in the disaggregated space, or the first one was Edgecore Network um, as a hardware provider. Um, they're part of the Acton Group. Um, they're quite large um, ODM, OEM manufacturer. The chances are a good proportion of the people in this room have deployed their equipment, maybe not aware of it because it had someone else's um, label on the tin, um, but pretty well respected. Um, we went, we did a POC with them, and it was a failure. Um, in particular, the exchange features were fragile was a polite word I settled on. Um, we called the POC off early, there was no way it was gonna pass. Um, but very luckily, Cathay Pacific did not have availability of the very next flight. So we, we could have gone sightseeing, but instead we actually talked to them and um, analyzed why it failed and figured out um, really was required from a NOS. Um, and they int went around, they, they didn't want to give up on the business, um, and actually through their relationships in the open networking found and introduced us to IP Infusion. Little background on them, those who have seen this presentation about uh, Zebra, actually um, IP Infusion are founded by the original uh, Zebra coders. But as a strategy, having moved away from specialist um, stack vendors, again, someone else's label, uh, they're trying to sell directly NOSs. Um, they worked with um, Edgecore, um, provided a demo, actually in particular focused again on the exchange features and went, I think we know what we're doing. It was an I think, but uh, that at least got our interest. Um, but the other bit, was the commitment. And one advice I'll give to anyone on a, the start of a difficult project is um, make sure that there is a commitment on your side. And relationship 101, if things are tough when things are going well, you're doomed when they go hard. Um, so actually um, believing that we could form a partnership was key um, at that scale. So our conclusion then is if this works, it's the right choice. We agreed a target solution, eVPN. Um, I think at this stage of Nanog, most people should be reasonably familiar, but the important bit um, is that instead of data plane learning, which has a whole load of uh, bugs associated with it or um, behaviors you really don't like, 
Um, this is all programmed as soon as the MAC address is known in one location, it's propagated by BGP. And at that point, um, you know that if it's not known on one individual router, it's not known anywhere. So the same way as um, if you don't have a matching prefix and no default root at layer three, you can drop. You can do the same thing, and instead of having the default behavior of flooding unknown traffic, you can change your default behavior of dropping um, unknown traffic. Other advantage, because it's a layer three overlay, it's tunneled, um, so you don't need to do a MAC flush reconvergence, um, so significant savings there. Um, also had other features uh, that we're looking at. Uh, Keybit, discuss with the vendors, agree the technical solution. Um, the key bit uh, that we had in addition to eVPN is we uh, really want to reduce background traffic, so uh, wanted to have proxy op and proxy ND. Proxy op, for those who are less familiar with that bit of eVPN, is um, you can program through BGP not just the IP, sorry, the MAC reachability, but also the MAC to um, IP, the ARC resolution or the neighbor discovery resolution. Um, and that gets flooded, and that means that whenever there's an ARC, instead of it being flooded to 500 um, or so members, uh, that one ingress router knows the answer and give a proxy response. Uh, but as always at the beginning of a project, um, option to fail back. The last thing we wanted is halfway through the migration, in comes a bug. Um, it somehow su would surprise one vendor. So we, all of these features we came in had the option on a particular member if there was an interop um, to selectively switch it off. Um, Fortune didn't have to, but that was the approach um, that we took. Um, and the other thing is we wanted to reduce as much background illegal, as much as we spend a lot of time telling our members, switch everything off, don't send us um, deck mop for, for anyone that's used Cisco, that's one that usually doesn't get switched off. Uh, it's far better if the um, exchange fabric just drops it. Now, if someone really is sending uh, bad traffic, we move them into quarantine, it's kind of the naughty step. Um, you go in, you, and then we'd actually want to see everything. But in the exchange, we want the ability to lock down to um, as much as possible known good traffic. So agreed features, agreed target. Um, and I've just pressed back. I was wondering whether that was very familiar. Questions, I, one question I often get asked is why did you not go for more SDN central controller? And being perfectly honest, it's the wrong DNA um, for links. Uh, we started as a team of network engineers. I mean, we, we all could code, but we were primarily network engineers. And our software team um, would primarily develop, designing things for internal use, nothing mission critical, and they weren't set up uh, for mission critical. We were building a software team, and in particular focusing on automation. But if we throw at that team, and now you need to build and maintain a mission critical SDN controller, um, that would have probably overstretched the team. Um, and the extra thing is, um, if you want fast convergence, if it's controller based, you then really need it to converge in the data plane. Uh, the management plane is really quite slow uh, convergence. So if, as we couldn't do uh, data plane convergence, um, we needed to do uh, the control plane. So here we are back um, in February, start of the real work. We now decided who we wanted to, we, um, which brought us to July. But as you can see, quite a gap before we reach um, live, which was in June. And being honest, a bigger gap than we thought it was going to be. A um, couple of surprises. Bringing this one is probably the biggest uh, shock. Initially, because they um, had a VPLS code and we were just going to add the eVPN control plane, we thought, okay, uh, eVPN over MPLS. 
a challenge in particular with the Broadcom um, ASIC is there's a limit of how many labels you can remove in one go. An entropy label, which is two labels, was a non-starter. Even the ESI label for multi-homing um, was one over budget. Um, we actually found a way to get around that, but that wasn't um, as to the letter of the RFC, so we would have had some very interesting in drops if we went down that path. Um, another thing that was suggested, you can go through the pipeline twice, but you're basically leaving half your bandwidth um, behind at that stage. Um, other thing we're getting from Broadcom is the actual MPLS layer two was designed for VPLS. Subtle difference, but on VPLS, um, pseudo wires are bidirectional, so you have one label for each remote PE. On eVPN, it's a common label, so all your remote PEs um, use the same label. So when you get and decapsulate a frame, you don't know which PE it comes from. You don't need to do data plane learning, so it's no longer a requirement, and it makes the protocol simpler. But if all the testing was based on one implementation, they were getting nervous. Um, and finally, each LSP um, consumes an interface in the interface table. And because of our scaling, our scaling forecast, we realized that um, N squared was going to kill us far sooner than we wanted. Broadcom, absolutely not a go at them. They were very supportive. Um, but in the end, uh, we went for the XLAN. It already existed. We'd already been working a lot on um, EVPN. So it was really taking a lot of the parallel bits of codes we've been working on and uh, mixing it together. Um, the, we had a few limitations, a lot around convergence, but we thought we could work around them. Um, going a, a key bit on the convergence that we found is that it was quite dependent on topology um, because the challenge you have, your control plane uh, can be very fast and knows exactly what needs to be done, but you then need to um, go and program the underlying ASIC, and that um, can actually take uh, a non-negligible a, a non amount of time. And the worst is if you need to reprogram um, the actual VXLAN tunnel. So if the reconvergence at ingress, in, we're seeing 300 to 600 milliseconds, and sit, whereas if it's not at the first hop, it was half of that. And to illustrate how you can get around that, um, taking an east and a west dark fiber and one member-facing switch, um, if you have a cut on the dark fiber, the reconvergence occurs on the member-facing switch that basically says, oh, well, don't send it via switch two, send it via switch one. Uh, next hop for the XLAN channel um, changes, needs reprogramming. If there's any local replication that needs changing, that's actually quite a slow push to the ASIC. If you put a spine in between, and it has advantage on scaling anyway, but if you put a spine in between, you go through the very same scenario, fiber cut, it's now the spine switch um, which reconverges. Next hop for VXLAN, unchanged. Um, it's a spine switch that does the reprogramming, no VXLAN uh, tax. Uh, question would be, okay, well you have that reconvergence if you lose a spine switch. But now it's CCMP. We were sending previously to two spine switches. One goes down, it's deleting an ECMP path as opposed to reprogramming the, the tunnel. And that actually is uh, 50 to 100 milliseconds reconverging. Um, and if there's an ECMP flip that's not on the tunnel endpoint, uh, that's about 50 milliseconds. And just for extra data, losing a link in a lag um, well below uh, 50 milliseconds. One tax we do have compared to MPLS, um, MPLS you can have um, standby pass and then preemption in the whole time before it reverts. IP routing, as you probably know, uh, reroutes immediately. Um, so you can get a hit um, if you need to reprogram a tunnel on restoration, um, but that is um, below 50 milliseconds. But in case of churn in particular, we did want to put uh, mechanisms for flat churning. Um, if not, we get extended uh, drops. But the key bit 
is it was better, and I really should have said much better than the previous convergence. It wasn't quite as good as MPLS, um, but it was close. Uh, generally not picked up by our members, and um, whereas the previous ones, there are a number of failures that were visible. So, few details on the technical solution. Um, so, leaf inspired, I think that's uh, re well t relative well known, but and that helped with the convergence. Um, we went for eVPN and proxy ARP. That was really easy for IPv4 because we only allocated one IP address, so it was actually in our CRM where all the Macs were and where all the IPv4s were. For IPv6, we actually allocate a range based on AS numbers, and we hadn't policed it, so we actually didn't know which, of the, which address within the range was deployed and where. We have a data cleanse to do before we can switch on IPv6, so those on the exchange, if we start asking about IPv6, that's because we want to switch on proxy ND. Um, but proxy ARP, um, even though we have the ability to selectively switch it off, we fortunately haven't had to. Another interesting thing that we picked up while testing um, as an extra feature is Mac holdout. It's actually not that well expected behavior that you get on a layer two uh, network. And the behavior that you have on the FDB is that a Mac on the egress switch will have an entry saying that MAC address will be on interface 23. And if interface 23 goes down, it's no longer valid um, entry and it gets deleted. And with the VPN, it'll actually work quite fast. It'll go and send a BGP update, much better than pre-VPN, pre sorry, pre-EVPN days where it's timeout, but there's still a delay as BGP converges. At that time, you actually get pretty bad flooding because rate limiting of unknown traffic is done at ingress. So the egress switch deleted its route. The ingress switch that should be throttling that traffic doesn't know um, that it's not deliverable, so will deliver it absolutely full speed to the correct egress switch, which will then flood it to all the ports. Graph, uh, this was something we actually picked up during the migration. Um, we had actually a um, quality of service probe that we hadn't migrated until the end of the migration. So you can see a number of the big members. These are five minute averages on a giggy port. Um, if you looked at the instantaneous, now we don't have the graphing system for that, but if you look at the instantaneous data, it spent um, a while at 100% um, each time there was a port that went down. So that was the old layer two behavior and actually um, you still have that without the MAC hold down um, on VPLS, uh, but eVPN plus MAC hold down, that replacement graph basically just removed the blue and it's just no flood. Um, and then we went beyond, we run micro BFD so that if we lose a link in the lag, uh, that gets detected four milliseconds. We'd spend a fair bit of time finding out how fast to tune our SPF. We want it to be as fast as possible, but not too fast. Um, a fair bit of, as we've talked about the topology optimization um, and the link dampening so have been added. Um, an important bit um, about the whole project, and this is explaining a bit of kind of what member base means, it's kind of an easy word, is we couldn't uh, deploy something and say, well, this is really for lots of capacity for our big members, or this is just for um, small members. So we had to be able to communicate uh, why it benefited everyone. And best is to pick at least the outliers. A challenge we had, um, in particular with 100 gig orders, is the previous ports were expensive, sometimes required chassis upgrades, if there was an unforecast order, um, we were nowhere near our target um, turnaround delivery time. Um, whereas new hardware, A, there's a lot more capacity and a lot more inventory, but B, we actually can have inventory sitting with pre-built designs, which means that at worst it's one maintenance window. Um, so within a fortnight, 
uh, the capacity will be there, but typically far faster than that. So much faster provision time for um, big members. The small members is all that thing about getting rid of the broadcast traffic, uh, getting rid of background traffic. So if you have a one gig port, the chances of you having um, a significant amount or even all of your capacity being hit by traffic that you really don't want um, is being reduced. And of course, something that is a benefit for everyone is quite a bit of a lower cost. Um, and throughout the project, we have been and um, still are passing those savings on to customers. As, uh, it's not the competitive pressure, but it's still the pressure of a member-based organization. Um, the last bit to go through is kind of summary of the project steps, what, what happened in those two years. Uh, I'm going to go relatively fast through here, but there was quite a long time of prototyping. That was when we were learning, fine-tuning the designs. They'd throw something. Uh, we'd give feedback, feedback on usability, and send it back. Um, that took us up to uh, November. Um, in November, we had something that if it was bug-free, was deployable. Um, and then we had a hardening phase where we stopped adding features. Um, one of the reasons that was quite an extensive process is um, whenever we picked, picked up a bug, we did a um, testing failure analysis and increased the coverage of the testing. And because that was a lot of test cases added very late, they weren't automated, or before they could do the test run, they actually had to uh, write the testing automation. So it took a little longer. Um, we found a few, mainly through an approach uh, that was slightly mischievous, um, as opposed to the testing that IP Infusion did, which is automated, um, a lot of the tests that we were performing as users, we trained the engineer and gave them rough instructions of do X, but didn't tell the engineer how to do it. And you ask five engineers to do the same thing, and somehow they managed to do it in seven different ways. Um, so we found a few different bugs that way. Um, but that's the good news. We then migrated um, over just over a month. We did one pilot site. Um, Found, waited for any surprises. Um, we actually did pick one traffic type that was left programmed on the ASIC that we hadn't tested, hadn't thought about as packet that looked like RIP but wasn't really RIP. Um, caused two short network events, but the good thing is all the hooks we did for instrumentation and testing um, were there to address that. Um, and that broken rule can be reprogrammed on the ASIC um, as opposed to requiring a software upgrade. The old LAN2 equipment definitely did not want to go without a fight. Um, it gave us far more grief than the equipment that replaced it. So we're now live. Um, being brutally honest, it actually went better um, than hoped. I was quite nervous. Um, end of last year, beginning of this year, and um, I'm really glad that so far, um, no issues. Um, we have done one software upgrade for last snags, the, the temporary fix, um, to make those permanent, but basically, it's now live. Any questions? Assuming I got a little bit of time. Andre Kamekov, Athena Health. Um, did you, you end up using any automation? And if you did, what, what is it? What tool are you using for automation? Um, we haven't switched it on yet, um, just to gain uh, resources internally. But it will be uh, net comp. We were initially going to look at Napalm, um, but instead we've gone for um, I was going to say PyCharm. Wow. It's on GitHub, and I've really got a memory blank of the name of the project, but it's um, oh, PyOcnos is, is basically a, 
something we have, it's on GitHub that basically for Ocnos pushes the configs and it's based on Jinja templates. Um, Thank you. But it's basically netconf. Thank you very much.